you very much, Roy. Um, I believe we will now have a question and answer session. So I'm looking in the chat to see if we've got any questions. Well, Frank, uh, there was a question and there still is there. Uh, I, I replied that I would uh, try to answer orally. And unfortunately, it's, um, that, that meant that the, the, the question looks like it's been solved, which is not at all what I was trying to do. Uh, but yeah. we can still read it under, um, I have it in French, résolu, uh, the question. Otherwise, I'll, I'll read it and, and answer it later. At the um, end. I I'm, I'm perfectly happy for you to answer it now, if you'd like. Okay, the first, I'll, I'll read the question. Uh, it's from Zinia Ziovelo. Uh, ethics is clearly at the heart of trustworthy AI, but is an issue specifically for the programmer, uh, programmers and algorithms or for the organization's corporate, corporate culture? Do we need potentially a moral code for AI as well in addition to code of conduct and necessary regulation? Thank you. And of course, I mean, we, I think we all have something to say about that, so I'll be very brief. Uh, the one thing I, I, I noticed when, when doing AI is that the um, it's not the, when there's an issue, the issue is not with the um, with the programming uh, because that's uh, an, an issue of mistakes being made in, in, in being called bugs in, in programming and that can be resolved. There, there might be in the public the idea that if an AI turn out to have to look like it has an ethnic or a gender or whatever um, sexual or preference uh, bias, that the programmer has done something wrong. Um, in 99% in, in of the cases, that's not the case. It is an issue with the data or where, with the, a, a lack of control of the data. Uh, when in a recent example, Microsoft had produced a, um, a piece of software that was dialoguing with people and turned out to be racist very uh, quickly. That was because the, the essential data that was used by the software uh, was data that was provided by the user by in the interaction with in the dialogue. And therefore the, uh, computer, the, the software wanted to please the customer and it pleased the customer. And what the customer wanted was not what Microsoft expected would happen. So that's an issue uh, of control of the, of the data that were being used. Um, um, the, the, the fact is that uh, the, the more we use large, large databases where, where they, 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 we might say there's an exhaustion of possible things that we could, could um, deal with, the issue there is not so much what we see, but what we would not want to see and that we would uh, regard as something that we have to eliminate. Yesterday, there was a speaker from, from Berkeley uh, who said that was that was a, a very important important issue. That are things that that simply that human beings do, that, but that they, we don't want to uh, see. And that in that case, yes, we have to introduce that. Um, the, the best approach is, of course, by law. And ethics could be kind of a stopgap if uh, if the law doesn't cover entirely the issue. Frank, we can't hear you anymore. Sorry. Thank you very much, Paul. Sorry. Uh, um, I just wanted to, have we any further questions? Um, I don't see any. I, I would uh, like o only to, to a remark. Very interesting, Paul. I totally agree with you. The problem is in that sometimes because we have no data, no segregate data enough in order to um, in order to improve the data we are dealing with. And, and sometimes this is, this is also the problem, the lack of the data that represent the reality as we want to represent it. In, in that case, Frank, if you allow, uh, I would like to, uh, uh, to reply to uh, Maria Manuel about something she said earlier, if, if that's possible at all. Yeah, please go ahead. It's the issue of, of uh, customization and uh, socialization. And um, because we, with risk-based pricing or risk-based uh, assessment or whatever situation, we try to customize. We try that, that the customer who has done nothing wrong is not being impacted by one customer that's done something wrong. But in, in, in that case, uh, cases are more and more specific. And in particular, if you are poor, it becomes more and more an important element in the, um, in the decision of what, what, you, what you will pay. Uh, that's nothing to, to do. Well, that's an issue because as you know, as we know, 
in business, poverty has a, a tendency to be regarded as something that's linked to personal character, and that's part of the representation in our society more and more. Uh, while another approach, and I guess that's one, the one from Maria Manuel, that there are social is issues being in involved. And we have to find a balance be between the two, especially since we can now customize much more than we did in the past. It was not because we were so generous in the past that we were socializing the approach and that the risk was diluted is because we didn't know. And with AI, indeed, we'll know more and more. And we can now, let's say, by the, uh, by the penny, decide what person is, is a risk. And, and the system doesn't care at all whether it's because the person is um, a, a low risk, because he, that person inherited a million from, from his father and his mother, uh, or, or, or anything of, of that type. I mentioned the thing which are really reprehensible, like the, 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 the profit margin being doubled uh, when, when it was subprime. That was just trying to you know, make money out of the poor. As we say because there are many of them and therefore there's a good cut to be uh, to be made about that but about and i'll finish by that I'll just i'll conclude i think we have a lesson there from uh, john menard keynes john menard keynes say to what looks like an economic problem most of the time the good solution the good reply is not at all economic at all and he gave us an example he say if we find out if the economists find that the best approach to an economy has to have 35 percent people without a job we will not, as a society, we will not decide that. We will find something which is not so optimal, economically speaking, but something that will satisfy society by making resentment in the population minimal, because we can also work on something, another variable, which is resentment in the population. And as we know now, with uh, some regimes here and there, allowing in society's resentment to, 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 to build up, leads to situations like the 1930s, where it was very high and where things became very difficult to control in one way or other. Very, very interesting, Paul. <laughs> very, 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 very interesting point. Uh, but but this, this is a problem. If we know where is the risk, you don't need to socialize the risk because you can identify precisely, I am a risky person, you are not because you are living in a, in, a, in a quarter that is more risky and so on for different perspectives uh, of insurance. So we need another mechanism in order to, uh, to include, in order to have an inclusive insurance system. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you both. Um, can I just sort of, um, I'd like to bring Rui in on that point and just, just reframe that a little bit. I think one of the things from an insurance point of view that comes out of that particular conversation is when we think about fairness, are we actually talking about fairly measuring the risk of a particular group or are we looking for equalization across groups? And the example that's in my mind is, I believe that under current legislation, men, young men and young women have to be offered the same sort of insurance premiums for, 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 um, for uh, driving motor vehicles. And we know sort of historically, I don't think it's controversial to say that young men behind the wheel of a car are a higher risk than young women, but they must be treated the same. No, that, that, that is true. Uh, however, as you know, there are insurance uh, solutions based on uh, telematics, for example, that allow those young adults that tend to have a more risky, riskier behavior to, we can use, as we discussed, uh, a possibility to influence their driving behavior and as such, uh, allowing them to have a lower premium. And that is also considered fair. If there, those young adults give us consent to uh, monitor their driving behavior and be able to provide recommendation services that uh, influence them in the right direction from a risk point of view. But is the risk, sorry, is the issue getting at their risk or is the issue cross-subsidizing between groups such that they all end up the same? We, we definitely need to ensure that there is a minimum level of mutualization. Uh, 
uh, of risk, uh, in particular for products that should be affordable by every individual. Does that make sense? Um, can I put a, a, a similar point to, to, to Alex? I know, I know you're not really going to look at it from the insurance point of view, but do you have the same sort of issues of fairness and discrimination from a, a telecoms perspective? Uh, yeah, but there, I mean, certainly are. Not, not maybe with the same sort of emphasis on the AI element, I guess. The issue is about, uh, you know, the more that telecoms becomes a central part and ingredient in everyone's lives, what is what is the fair and appropriate um, kind of basic level of provision for people who are, you know, are more disadvantaged. So, and in fact, we have various kind of sort of social, to something called BT basics or social tariff type offer for people who are unemployed or on different types of benefits. And I, I think that will, that sort of uh, focus pressure will increase for a minimum level of provision for, for everyone if everyone is dependent on the technology to, to do all sorts of other things, including, you know, banking and insurance and education and healthcare and all, all the rest of it. Um, so it's a slightly different kind of policy issue, I suppose. I mean, back, back to the, the one you were just on, and you know, not, not, as you say, from an informed view of an insurance company at all, but um, I guess the interesting question is what is, is is it fair to have absolute sort of cross subsidy and same offers for everyone or is there a different kind of fairness that can still apply different sorts of offers depending on your circumstances it seems to, to me that the issue with the ai is that it could cloud some of those things further so at, at the minute people will get different offers and rates and whatever else depending on their age circumstances healthiness whatever if it's not visible to them why they might be completely removed from a whole load of potential offers because the technology has kind of done that in a way that no one can really see or understand that is a sort of a further problem if you like on on top of the question of what's fair in first place because you can't even debate what is going on um, so that's that's why the sort of questions about the visibility and transparency of the sort of human agency in, involved are so important and that probably will have a cut across to all sorts of other AI situations. Okay, marvellous, thank you very much Alex. Um, do we have any further questions? I, I, I can't see any questions. Federica, are there any other questions? Not at the moment. Okay. Well, I think if that's that's it, um, then I, I should really draw this session to a close. Um, thank you all very much for that. One thing that uh, I certainly got out of it um, that will that I'll make sure is reflected in the final report is the emphasis on the social and environmental aspects. I mean, we have thought about that, but I um, I, I wonder uh, after this session if we thought about it enough. I'll make sure that it's. Um, something that is reflected in the final document. Frank, okay. there's, there's a yeah. question just coming now, if you okay. can probably see it. Yeah. Can you see it? Nope. You have to read that. For some reason you were getting them, Paul. So okay. did yeah, you I'll, read that? Yeah. I'll, I'll read it. It's mm. from Brian Tranter. I think the insurance industry is creating its own problems. If premiums are based on individual risk, then higher high risk people end up being excluded so that low premiums can be offered to low risk people. This excludes high risk people. Insurance should share risk. Okay. Um, I guess I'll put that to Rui in the first instance because you're directly from the industry. Well, I think we, we need to, as I said, distinguish uh, price, pricing differentiation from pricing discrimination. So the same risk should pay the, sh the same price. That's, uh, and based on the risks we are assessing, we calculate the right premium. So as long as we are looking at the same risks, we should charge the same premiums, regardless of it's a man or a woman, or uh, people from different uh, segments. 
that, that's uh, the basic principle of non-discrimination. If indeed, uh, as uh, we also discussed, some individuals consciously have uh, higher risk behavior, then they, they will pay the premium associated with that conscious risk behavior. And I think this is uh, part of the fairness principle we are trying to, to, to apply to our, to our own business. Paul, I, a comment? Yeah, can uh, I ask, I'm, 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 I'd, I'd like to ask Rui, Rui a, a question just uh, in line with what, what he just said. Um, let's, let's uh, financial risk from, from a customer for one reason or other. In most, in most countries, this is associated as a correlation with ethnicity, with the fact of belonging to a particular group, because our societies, and that's not something we decide, uh, are not fair in that respect. And it, it's, it's very much in the, in the, yes, at the center of the news currently United States. How do you de deal with the fact that there are correlations between things out which are purely objective, uh, like financial reliability of, of our customer being probably uh, having some implication in terms of who that person is within society? Uh, well, in some in some markets like the UK market, you can use credit scoring as a risk factor. It's not the case in all the other uh, European markets, for example. So the, it it is already in place. Uh, yes, it is true that uh, 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 our experience and loss experience shows that. Um, People living in particular neighborhoods typically will, might be of the same ethnicity, might have, uh, uh, might show more, more, more claims, more accidents, more risks. Um, we will take that into consideration when calculating the price. What is not fair is someone that moves from a neighborhood A to a neighborhood B and because in the neighborhood B, typically it's a higher risk area, we'll be charging a higher premium to that individual. Those, those cases should be uh, considered and uh, we, we should avoid uh, treating a particular individual uh, differently you know, in a way that is being penalized just because he has moved for, to a neighborhood who is considered higher risk. Lima, do you want to comment? Uh, yes, Frank, I, I would like, I, I'm a little bit worried about this uh, uh, last discussion and I suggest that uh, in final report, this point will be more, more discussed if possible. That is what were the consequences of this uh, moving from the socialized yeah. risk approach to an individual, individual risk approach. Um, yeah. And the problem is not only discrimination based on gender or, or uh, sexual orientation, or uh, um, this is also a problem, but this is not the main problem. The problem is uh, about uh, if the the risk of even of a car or or uh, is related to the my wage my the the, 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 my, the street where I live or the part of the city where I live uh, my the nature of my employment contract and so on uh, because this is different nowadays because I am a flat rate for everybody for instance to 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 the car it depends on the age of the car but not in, in my directly on my wage and things can change and um, it could be a very interesting political and social problem okay. can i just sort of it are going one... to be so but i think we also need to distinguish between features of the consumer that are about choice and behavior and ones that are about their state. So there are things like ethnicity. There's nothing yes. really you can do about your ethnicity. Yes, uh, yes, totally agree. But we want to penalize bad behavior and, 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 and incentivize good behavior, right? Uh, 
Um, Sometimes I can control my behavior. I can have a risk behavior because I smoke. Uh, it, it's a choice, but other things are not a choice and a status. Yeah, okay. Right. Um, do we have anything else to, uh, any other questions? Um, Paul, you don't see any more, do Paul, you? Paul, what's Just your welcome. opinion about this problem? Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, I've, I've, I've worked in, in a number of different countries and, um, and, and Frank just, uh, no, it was Rui who made a, 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 referred to the fact that countries behave differently. Uh, what, what I, I worked in the, um, in the lending industry for 12 years in, in the United States and I, and I, and I worked also in, in, in Europe and in, in, in Britain, in uh, Holland, in France. Um, that there's a very different attitude towards what depends on your choices or not. There is a tendency in the United States to regard anything uh, in your behavior as, as, link, as linked to the strengths of your character. Things that we definitely in Europe regard as being social issues, uh, which are mutualized by necessity. That's the way they are. Um, there's a tendency I've seen in the United States that, that uh, if you're poor, that's a personal decision. That's because of all your but the bad choices you've um, you've done, and and I've priced mortgages for years uh, with a grid that was implying that there was nothing like a social dimension. It's only when the the, the, the subprime crisis started that I could uh, have the ear of my bosses when I said, we need to look at the industry within the general framework of the economy. And we can't just simply regard every little partner we have as somebody who will make a good or a bad choice. There are things which are happening like the interest rates and things like, like that. But what, that's a message that was very difficult to, to convey in, 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 um, in the United States, much easier, of course, in Europe, uh, whether, whether in the United Kingdom, in France or Holland or, uh, that didn't, didn't make any difference. That there are cultural attitudes towards this. But even in the United States, we know there is a lot of uh, of work on that, uh, on the tyranny of merit. Uh, that is not possible. I'm poor people. I'm going not to go too hard, but it's not. <laughs> one person, one person who worked consistently about mm -hmm. that in the eighties and nineteen and nineteen mm nineties -hmm. was uh, you may not know that it was Elizabeth Warren. Wrote about that. <laughs> hey. um, well, that's great. That's been a, a fascinating discussion and more stuff for, for, for the report in the end. Um, do we have anything more? I don't see any questions. Uh, please, Frank, mm -hmm. let us know about re the final version of the report uh, when it is available. Will do. Will do. Okay. Uh, well, if we don't have anything further, um, I shall draw this uh, particular working session to a close. Thank you all very much for your participation. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank it's you. a pleasure to discuss with all of you and to read the report. Very Thank interesting. You. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. See you Bye. soon. Bye.